Oh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. It is a Monday. My kids are off school, and uh, we're going to bring in our. I'm going to bring in Rick Barner right now because he is. He's got a very busy week, and this is Pickup Lines presented by Gomez Law Fights. I'm not going to hit you, Rick. I promise. But this is my sponsor is Gomez Law Firm, and they gave me these amazing gloves, and so uh, I'm obligated every time I come on to talk about Gomez Law and. They've been practicing law for 50 years here in uh, San Antonio, so I want to thank them so much for their support. Um, Rick Varner is in the house here, and you are the director of the, it's the SCOBY Education Center. Correct. Planetarium and is here. The planetarium's been here since 1961. Uh, so uh, we actually built the SCOBY Education Center around that original dome. And then right behind us is the Santicos Micronaut Center. Mm -hmm. which is for the little micronauts, okay. little astronauts, and uh, that just opened this past spring. I love it. Um, so if you could see through the back seat of the window, that's what he's, uh, by the car, that's what he's talking about. Well, we brought Rick in because uh, it's a very big week, and if you're anything of an astronomy buff like I am, um, then Saturday morning you're going to be looking upward at this the eclipse event that we're going to be having. I thought it'd be cool to have some, because I'm, I'm a little smart, but I'm not nearly as smart as Rick is. <laughs> to come in and talk about what's going to happen, kind of set the table for us, and talk about, you're going to have a massive event. We're, we're at San Antonio College. You're going to have a massive event here. Correct. We're expecting about 5,000 people. And uh, we've ordered, we're a NASA Community Anchor awardee. We, we've been on their list, so they funded us to buy glasses, the solar glasses okay. that like these, that we'll actually give away during the course of, of that event. And so... As you put them on, you'll see everything kind of disappears. Oh, wait a minute. I was going to say, I can't see anything through this these is, things. And, and it's, as a safety thing, you know, you, when you put these glasses on, you don't walk around and do stuff. You can know you will not be able you, to. I mean, you can't see anything except the sun. Okay, so that's interesting. And by the way, I want to give people an opportunity. If you have a question, and I'm going to do my best to kind of look at the comments here. Some of you may have questions about the eclipse, about glasses. And, and that brings me to a question. My friend Adrian uh, reached out to me last, last night. And was and wanted to ask two questions. One, uh, is there such thing as counterfeit glasses that are being sold, and how do you know if the ones you have are legit and that are not going to mess up your eyes? Uh, yes, and in fact, um, if you look on the inside, most of the time you'll see uh, identif identifying on the arm. notes on the inside arm, yeah. and it says uh, ISO. In this case, it's twelve three twelve dash two. And so it's like a certified. Oh, so you're looking number. for this number right here. Yeah, they're, it's certified that right they're they're actually made by a reputable company that tested them. So ISO is what you're looking for. Yes, and um, and, and there's also the American Astronomical Society's website that gives a list of vendors that are reputable vendors. Oh, okay. Uh, NASA even fell into this several years ago before the 2017 eclipse, where they bought them through a vendor because they got like the lowest bid. Yeah. And then when their guys tested them, they didn't meet the standard. That's crazy. We were reminiscing about the 2017 event because you reminded me it was the first day of school. Yes. I remember running out in the, the kids were home, ran out in the backyard and caught that. How will this coming Saturday's eclipse differ or be similar to what we saw in 17? In 2017, we were, uh, it was completely a partial eclipse. And so the moon never completely went across the disk of the sun. Okay. This event's an annular eclipse, which is cooler because they, they also call it the ring of fire. Yes. So it, we're in the path so that if the moon were closer to us, then it would actually be lined up for a total eclipse. Okay. But the moon is at, at um, apogee, which means right. away. I like to think of alliteration, so apogee for away. Okay, okay. It's farther away, and so the disk of the moon is not large enough to cover the disk of the sun. Thus, you get the ring of fire. Correct. So it's it's kind of like a, you know, like a selfie light that is bright <laughs> yes. around the edges. Yes. Think of it as a really, really bright selfie light. I love it. And it's a perfect transition to my next question that I had from Adrian yesterday. And, and for those of you just joining us here, we're talking about the eclipse coming up this weekend on Saturday. And, and I want Rick to break out the timeline because it's not going to be like just a couple of minutes. It's going to be an, an event that we'll talk about here in just a minute. But my friend Adrian brought up another good point yesterday because there will be a temptation on Saturday when this is happening for people to grab their phone, point it up at the sky for an extended period of time to try to capture the eclipse. And the question is, is it safe or will you destroy your phone 
if you point your smartphone up to the sun for any length of time? One thing to think about, especially now, so many smartphones have multiple cameras on them. Yes. That they they don't fit behind these little eye holes, if okay. you would. And so if you put this in front of the phone and it completely covers it, it'll protect it for a short time, but your phone is actually more sensitive than your eyes. And so you, you need something that fully filters the, the camera. And if you don't, it'll it'll void the warranty and burn out your camera. Right. So so just to be clear, if you were just to point your, oh, let me get a quick picture and, and real quick point it up at the sun. It's not good. Bad idea. No. You can take you can take pictures of a sunrise and sunset because right. you're getting the filtered sun. Yes. And just like we can look at a sunrise or sunset. Right. But right now, for example, the sun is getting to the point in the sky where it's going to be for the eclipse on Saturday. Okay. And it's too bright to look at. Your eyes no, will yeah, tell you, sure. this hurts, don't look at the sun. For sure. And so your camera can't tell you this hurts, it just burns out. Yeah, um, that's interesting. So you're talking about where the sun is right now um, in relation to Saturday. Can you give us the timeline of people waking up or planning their Saturday around college football or whatever they're going to do on Saturday? What's going to be happening? When does it happen? So we'll start our event here at 930 and we'll have food trucks and vendors all across the west side of the San Antonio College campus. We'll have a stage set up. We'll have speakers who will begin right around 10 o'clock. The, the edge of the, of the eclipse starts at about 1020 something. Okay? okay. And it changes based on where you are. So here at San Antonio College, I believe it's 1022. But if you were a little bit northwest of us, it should be earlier than that. If you're okay. southwest of us, it's later. Later. And so where you are, it changes minute by minute okay. on your location. The, the end of the partial eclipse is around 1.30 for here, okay. the spot. Okay. And the, the ring of fire part is right around 11.54. And that's about four minutes. Okay. 11.54 is like in the middle when it should be lined up the best. So a couple minutes on both sides of that. Now, getting to the ring of fire part, where in theory you're not seeing the the sun, is that something you can look at with the naked eye? No. Same thing. Don't be tempted. No, this Saturday you can never just look at the sun. You have to have the glasses. Okay. You have to have filtering. Uh, protective lenses over telescopes. Any Anything like that. You never should use uh, an optical instrument to look at the sun, because it's just like taking a magnifying glass. The, the sun gives off more than 1,300 watts of power per second. Right. And so if you, you know, if you put a lens in front of the sun, it'll burn. Okay. And it'll burn your eye or it'll burn the electronics or whatever. Okay. So, so we're just putting out there's a public safety announcement because yes. I know there are a lot of people or, or that, that'll be tempted or they've got a great phone and they think they can get a great picture and everything. And my buddy John Alonzo, who is an amazing photographer, is talking about his plans. If you guys have any questions or, or thoughts or ideas or anything for your plans for the eclipse on Saturday. Uh, Rick Berner is here. He's the director of the Scobie Education Center at San Antonio College and just a wealth of knowledge. I know you've brought some props in here with you and I'm not even going to pretend to guess what all of these things are, but if you have something that you wanted to show sure. off or demonstrate. Well, one of the things we can we can show, this is an activity we'll do okay. inside the building on, on uh, Saturday. Uh, we'll have these UV beads, which we've brought out to a lot of community events. Um, the little white beads on here react with the sun. You can see one of them is caught, so two of them on the ends have caught the sun, and they're turning back from purple and blue. But if I what? stick them into the sunlight, and, and actually in a car, uh -huh. your car windows should be UV tinted. Yeah. And so it should prevent them from turning, which is a good indication that right. they're not really turning. Okay. So your car is, is in Hey, all right. But this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And what we see is this teeny little line right in the center there. That's what our eyes see. But we got all of these other wavelengths that um, impact how we live and work every day. Okay, let me take a look at this thing. So, okay, so that that's, again, this is pretty fascinating. I'm going to give you the close-up. So you're saying... We see that vertical line right there. Yeah, the teeny little line where the, the rainbow is. That's a visible light. And the slower, wider wavelengths right. are infrared, okay. is, which means just below red. Those over there. And those are associated with warmth or heat. Okay. And then you get into radio and t microwave, radio and TV waves. Oh, my goodness. And then gracious. above that, just beyond violet, is ultraviolet. Yeah. And that. Of course, those are sun sunburns, etc. Oh, and so we're, we'll have an activity for that. Um, one of the things related also to viewing is 
that we'll be giving away the glasses okay. at a booth at the end of the the run of uh, trees here. Okay. We'll have canopies set up with like a dozen different organizations. Uh, oh. We'll have this. This is one of our pinhole viewers, and the the Great American Eclipse folks allowed us to use that graphic of Texas. Okay. And you see in there, of course, the the crossing. We have the annular eclipse here yeah. on Saturday, right? But then April eighth, next year, we're on the edge of the total eclipse. San Antonio is bisected by the total eclipse, and and the odds in that happening are just the fact that that, that has happening. Pardon the pun, or astronomical, right? Yes, to, to to have two eclipses in the same area within the same year is really rare. Um, I, you know, they, they happen every eighteen months or so, right? But people get in jets and cruises and right. they go to do these things. Right. They're eclipse chasers. Um, and they'll they'll take off to see the next eclipse. But to be able to stay home and see two exactly. is amazing. And we're the largest metropolitan area, the only uh -huh. metropolitan area that gets both of these eclipses this year. Maybe a little tourism, a few, few yep. tourism dollars will come in as well. And uh, another thing that we'll be giving out is the, the punch um, pinhole viewer. So with this one, for example, you punch a hole in there okay. and it allows you to see the sun on the ground or on a piece of white paper. This one has the holes already punched in it, which is funny because the name of the mission is Punch. Right. It's a sun studying mission that's not launched yet. But you line up these holes on the ground and you'll see the image of the sun through the, the card onto the ground. So not looking up at the sky. Correct. You looking... hold this like over your shoulder with the sun behind you. I see. And then you see the image ahead of you. In front of so you. So like okay. if I held the back of the, the white paper, okay. I could see this through here. Uh, um, okay. You don't need those things because right. you can stand under a tree or you can simply cross your fingers uh -huh. like this. Again, with the sun behind you. Right. Let it come through, look at the ground, look at, have it show up on a, like a bright white sidewalk or a piece of paper. So my friend John Alonzo is asking here, and I just I just wanna make sure I'm reading this right. He says, using neutral density and levels that you can say, what is necessary for safe levels for camera equipment? Uh, you really need to get the, the filters that are designed for your equipment. Um, okay. We're having Celestron Telescope come here. They'll actually be on the roof of our building, and they'll have um, a tent set up back behind where we're right, right now. Um, and they made available the the lenses for the telescopes that are volunteering to come out. Okay. They made a link ahead to them, uh, available to them ahead of the eclipse, and so they provided those filters. Very cool. Um, if you go to the, the maker of your camera, and, and they should have a lens that fits for your camera. Yeah, all right. Well, we love the question. If you have any other questions here, we're talking with Rick Berner uh, here at the Scobie Education Center at San Antonio College about the eclipse happening on Saturday. A lot of you may have questions or you haven't experienced something like this before, and we're just doing our best to educate you. It fascinates me. I mean, I told Rick there are many times I get on, I get uh, pulled into videos on Facebook or the social media platforms which have facts about the sun, how big it is, and, and, and I, I wonder if if you have a, a fascinating fact or two about it that just really amazes you. One of the things, I used to work in education at the Goddard Space Flight Center up in Maryland, and I got a chance to go to a lot of school groups across the uh -huh. Northeast. There is a mission called SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, that studies the sun. And almost every day, they send back these amazing images that are just steeped with data. And you can actually go online to their website, and there's a gallery. One of the images, the HMI, I believe it's called HMI, is a. it looks like a black and white image. Mm -hmm. And what it does is through that wavelength, it shows you all the sunspots mm -hmm. and the granular surface right. of the sun. Right. And so every sunspot, it looks like a little grainy black and white yeah. disc. So we, we see them as little dark spots. Right. But when, when we look at them through that wavelength, they're black and white. They're actually magnetic storms. And... The, the white part of the spot is the North Pole, the South part is the, the South Pole is the black part. And so you can actually watch the sunspot over time move across the disk. And the, the equator of, of the sun moves faster, it twists faster than the latitudes above, above and below it. So it's like a rubber band nodding up. Oh. And those, where those knots happen are where the sunspots are. And 
if you look at this over time on that website from yeah. NASA, yeah. you can actually put a piece of paper or a piece of plastic up there and mark them with a Sharpie or something. You can do the science and track a sunspot moving across the latitudes above and below the equator. And this is like fourth graders do this with me. And it, I love it. And they, they feel like they're heliophysicists. Don't be using big words like that. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on a second. I, those, those are big words. But uh, again, that kind of stuff fascinates me. And, and I'm sure there are going to be plenty of people uh, watching. If you're just joining us, Rick was saying that on Saturday, you're gonna, you guys are going to be hosting a huge event, a free event. It's free. For people here at San Antonio College, if, you, if you'd like to experience this, you know, with the community or in a, in a, in a place like this, uh, how early will people be coming out here? Do you think uh, we're starting at nine thirty? But I know that we'll have we'll have our groups out here as early as six in the morning. Yeah, uh, we'll be everything. Everything will start setting up Friday beforehand. Um, and uh, there's we dropped the fee for parking, which was originally there. Um, the only fees will be for like the food trucks or right. the little private groups that are doing activities with us. But all the activities in Scoby are free. Yeah. Uh, the, the speakers that'll be on the, the Boeing Company stage here are free. And Scobie obviously is here. I mean, part of part of San Antonio College. How accessible is it to the public? Uh, and what what could they find here that maybe they don't realize sure. is here? Well, every Friday night, the planetarium and the center are open to the public. Um, there's no fee to come into the building. There are small fees for the tickets to the three planetarium shows. And we've actually made them available online in advance of the program. So here we are on Monday. You can actually go online today and buy tickets for this Friday, Friday the 13th shows. And um, last week they were sold out for the children's show before we even opened the doors. I mean, I, I gotta believe the kids especially love, love this kind of stuff. The wow yes. factor is there. Yes, and we've been very fortunate to have a lot of really cool partners like Southwest Research Institute. Uh -huh. Uh, we have a number of astronauts who have come to visit. Eileen Collins lives in this area, and she's an amazing historical figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they make themselves available to our community through SCOBY. You know, you mentioned Southwest Research Institute. I don't know if people realize just kind of the role that facility or, or the work that's done there plays in the greater oh, yeah. good when it comes to things related to space. Yeah, we have a really neat exhibit inside with a timeline of some of the missions that Southwest has contributed to. Uh, if you remember, there was a lot of hoopla around uh, our flyby of Pluto. Uh -huh. And the first time we were that close and we had this new instrumentation with great images mm -hmm. and such, this big heart that showed up on the face yes. of Pluto. Um, a lot of the people who did the engineering for that mission are right here in San Antonio. Um, the, the researchers are often in Colorado and other places, right. but the meat and potatoes of it are right here. So let's get this out of the way right now. Is Pluto a planet or not? It's the same thing it was before. They just changed <laughs> the definition. It, it's like the way I tell my kids is that, you know, this year you're a sixth grader, but next year you meet all the requirements to be a, a seventh grader right. or eighth grader. Or right. You change because your definition changes. And so Pluto was grouped with the planets but it really wasn't defined as a planet. So when somebody says, so what is the definition of a planet? Well, they came up with a criteria and yeah. Pluto no longer qualified. There, there are moons around other planets that are a lot like Pluto. Well, Cirrus, Cirrus uh -huh. is the largest asteroid. It's, they all have numbers yeah. and uh, Cirrus is number one because it was the first one they saw. It's a dwarf planet just like Pluto is. Right. But there are other heavenly bodies out there that are larger than Pluto, right? Yes. That are not necessarily in the planets that we know. And Pluto is compared. Pluto has five moons around it. Okay. And the biggest one, Charon, is so close in size that you can't say that Charon orbits Pluto because they orbit what's called the barycenter, which is a space in between. They're kind of like doing a pirouette. Got it. Like uh, like skaters in the Olympics, you know. Okay. Okay. And. Um, and so that's that's part of the deal is that Pluto's not big enough to have a moon that just orbits it. They they move together. I see. All right. Do you have a favorite movie or TV show that that, that has taken place in space that did it correctly in terms of the science? I really like the way they did The Martian. Um, okay. There's a lot of them that I look at that uh, I think they're looking at science fiction into the future. Right. And. Sometimes science fiction kind of bears out to be true. Right. 
but uh, Matt Damon, I remember he's he's stranded yeah. on yeah. on on Mars and has to survive and communicate and figure out a way to get rescued and all. I that think stuff. they did a really good job with that. I also re it also reinforces that never get on a plane or travel with Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, he's he's often he's a bad omen somewhere. Yeah, how does that happen? <laughs> um, but so to that effect, uh, in our lifetime, will will a Matt Damon or other human land on Mars and be able to stay there for an extended period of time? There's a lot to learn, and I think that's why we're going back to the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to go to the moon, we can we can basically order out for groceries. You know, we can get to the moon in a few days. Yeah. But to get to <laughs> Mars, you've got like 18 months, and so you've got to send groceries uh, ahead. That's so a to long speak. DoorDash. To, yes, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the tip and the fees will just do you in. So, you know. <laughs> we're talking with Rick Varner here uh, with the Scobie Education Center. I love these questions because it'll come up. If you had the opportunity to go to Mars and and be away from your family that long, would you take it? I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I have, you know, I, I have a lot of the Earth that I still need to explore. Yeah, yeah, no and, kidding. Uh, and it's less uh, inhospitable to go to Antarctica than it would be to go to Mars because there's kind of air and water and stuff. Yeah, so like, again, yeah, let that sink in. Less hospitable, you said, to go inhospitable, to... Or inhospitable yeah, to yeah. go to Antarctica because obviously the, the oxygen and all that stuff. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what do you make of, is there, I, I heard about this asteroids or, with, with fine metals on them that, that are worth gazillion, trillion, yeah. quadrillion dollars that are floating around out there? Uh, that's, anything that's rare is mm -hmm. expensive. To be mined? Yeah, and so to be able, I think they're, they're studying Psyche right now. and the sample That's the name of it, it right, yeah, 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 okay, I couldn't remember the name. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to learn about those early inhabitants of the solar system yeah you know that a lot of the asteroids formed before the earth did yeah and um so they hold the clues to what was going on back then yeah yeah we have a lot of good theories i those, hear you like, now, in the parks that's fascinating so this question came up the other day in discussion with a friend of mine if a, a meteorite or or a piece of an asteroid or whatever it is i guess a meteorite lands in your yard or in your property who owns that you do by law yeah, you own it if it's in your yard. Okay. There's a really great story of a, a woman in the Bay Area in California mm -hmm. where one of these um, hit her roof of her house. And, you know, often we we um, we see these things on the ground and we don't know the story. Right. You know, there's these great scenes in one of the Apollo movies where the, the geologist picks up a rock and he says, okay, little guy. How did you get here? What's yeah. your story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you know where it came from, where it hit, and you can trace the trajectory, you get more of the story. Then you can pick up the analysis of the of the elements, yeah. and you can figure out what asteroids it may have come from. Mm -hmm. And so they, they try to do that. They try to go backwards and figure out the story. Yeah. Um, they collect them from Antarctica. We actually have a disk in our safe that we're allowed to use with uh, teacher training that has samples from Antarctica uh, meteorites. And they have a treaty that they only use those for science. I was about to ask you, I mean, I don't know how many secrets you can give away, but what, what is the coolest or maybe the most valuable thing on the premises here, I guess, in your vault? Well, we have moon rocks and mm -hmm. we have, um, we do have the meteorites. And again, they're, they're secured and have all this the, the yeah. security that goes with that, and we um, we we don't bring them out unless we have our our officers around. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's also a lot of historic items inside the building that are down around the gift shop area. Right. Like the um, people don't always remember that John Kennedy spoke here in San Antonio mm -hmm. before going to Fort Worth and mm -hmm. Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, when he spoke here, they sectioned off the stage. Yeah. And they gave that to the people at the the Brooks Medical Center. Mm -hmm who helped to facilitate all mm -hmm. that. Well, one of those is here. Um, one of the flooring parts are here. The, um, the, some of the documents from, from Lyndon Johnson are here. Mm -hmm. the, um, the medical history for, the, for when Deke Slayton was grounded, one of the original Mercury astronauts, that's here. And, and they're in glass casing, you know, around right. the gift shop area. And the kids look at them and they're like stacks of paper. Yeah. 
there's a picture of an old guy, <laughs> you know, but then the grown-ups read it and say, hey, wait, come yeah. over here and look at this. Yeah, there's there's more to it. For insurance purposes, how do you assign a value to a moon rock? Or is there such a thing? Uh, you don't. You don't assign a value to it. Priceless. Uh, when Whenever we had to ship them, we had to assign the value of the materials that are in the disc and stuff, not the rocks themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you have to kind of keep it under the radar and make it inconspicuous. I get it. I get it. A couple more minutes here with Rick Varner. Just, and as you can see, I'm, I'm like, I fanboy over this kind of stuff because um, I, I really have always loved astronomy and just fa Now, I probably would never get in a rocket because the G-forces would make me sick and I probably couldn't handle that. Um, but I'm just fine watching it here on, on, on the ground. So I'll, I'll be looking Saturday. I saw you brought this in. Yes. Tell me about this. All right. This is, this is like a model we can put in a car. Okay. okay. We have versions of this that are like 27 feet long. Okay. And so that's Doesn't fit in this uh, car. a little hard to do. <laughs> but there's a, one of the questions we often get is why isn't there an eclipse every new moon and every full moon? Okay. Um, we only get solar eclipses when there is a new moon. So if I put this toward the camera, right. where you see the little moon in the front, uh -huh. most of the time, the eclipse, the the new moon has the moon above or below oh, okay. because it has a about a five degree inclination to the plane the Earth orbits on. Yeah, and so when it's like this, there's no eclipse right. because the shadow, it's above or right. below the right. Earth. Right, right, and then when it's in the full moon side, it's the same thing. Okay. where it's above or below. There's no no lunar eclipse. Yeah. When it lines up, like in this case, you see it's blocked by the bigger right. Earth. And of course, these are not the, the beads are not to scale, right. and they're way closer together yes. than they would. But this is a really simple little model that you can use. But I love it when you tilt it; it, it ter perfectly explains because I, I get where people would think, "Well, wait a minute, every thirty days or so, why don't we have right. you know?" And so when we have an eclipse, it's, it's kind of like this, where you see the little disc right in front of the right. big right. the big sphere. Well, that's what will happen when you have a solar eclipse. Yeah. And it depends on where the moon is. If it's farther away, right. then it's going to be annular. If it's closer, it'll be total. I was reminded the other day, the moon does not give off its own light, right? It's Correct. just reflecting light from the sun. Correct. And we see, we see the daytime side of the moon, and we see the side that always faces us. It orbits right. and it turns at the same rate. It revolves and rotates at the same rate. So we've been looking at the same side of the moon our entire history. Correct. And um, and and it's turning, but from our perspective, right. we always see the same side. So you would have to physically travel behind the moon to see where the Autobots and the Decepticons and the Transformers or whatever, <laughs> whatever's on the dark side of the moon. Well, the dark side, it's the far side. Or the far side, excuse the me. The far side. Dark side, cool album, but it's, it's a <laughs> That's different something thing. else. Yeah, the, the, the far side of the moon is the side we don't see. Right. But it gets daylight too, because it's going around and I eventually see. it's daytime. Oh, like it, when it's a new moon, yeah. the, the far side is in daytime. Okay. And we see the nighttime side. I like how you explain it in elementary terms where someone like myself can understand. Um, how will next April's event eclipse differ from what we're going to see Saturday? The, the moon is at perigee, which means it's closest. Mm -hmm. I can't think of an alliteration that goes with okay. it, but, but it's closest to us. And so the disk of the moon appears bigger, uh -huh. and it blocks the sun. It's 400 times closer than the sun, but the sun is 400 times bigger mm. than the moon. So it should be darker next April? In, on April 8th, if you're in totality and yeah. only in those that swath of totality, right. You will be able for about two minutes in this area, for around mm -hmm. two minutes, you'll be able to take the glasses off and look at the sun. And you'll see the corona and the, yeah, yeah. the amazing linings that are out in the space around it. And it'll darken, it'll cool. Uh, animals will behave differently. Um, the tides, will that will it affect all that too? Um, well, the perigee and apogee does. That. Okay, okay. And, and having them in lined up like that, um, the tides do change, but it's not because it's an eclipse. It's, because it's new moon full. Will my kids be more calm? That's what I want um, Probably not. <laughs> and it's Monday, so they'll be in school unless... unless so so is it a Monday during the day? Yeah, April 8th. It's in the middle of... It's actually around 1-ish, I think. They're April. all going to be outside. And imagine. hopefully they are. Hopefully hopefully their schools will get them the proper glasses. Yeah. And they'll do the things so that they can have a festival at their school. 
uh, Celestron, who's here again, right. uh, provided a bunch of our teachers from the Teachers Academy with classes for their schools. Northside, I think, is buying them for all of their school kids. Okay. And uh, each district hopefully will do something so that their kids can do this once in a lifetime. Because I was going to say, are they, my children, will they ever get an opportunity like this in South Texas again? Uh, they they will, but they probably will have to go somewhere. Mm. It won't be in San Antonio for hundreds of years again. And so, you again, you know, to be in this place where where your feet are. Yeah. You know, it's cool stuff. It's unique. I like, well, listen, I could go on and on, but he has a very busy week ahead of him as the host of this massive event Saturday. Again, if you want to participate, they're going to be giving away these glasses and all the cool demonstrations. What we just talked about is just a fraction of what you'll get Saturday morning here at San Antonio College. If you'd like to come over, you said 5,000 or so. We're expecting around. Um, and it sounds like the weather's going to be amazing. And uh, if we don't have any clouds in the sky like today, I mean, today's a pretty good day. So, yes. Rick, this has been a special treat. I love this stuff and I could go on and on for hours, but I really appreciate you uh, educating me and our viewers today and uh, looking forward to this weekend. It should be a great week. All right, more, if people want more information, come find Rick over here at the, uh, the Scobie Education Center at San Antonio College. Come visit and check out some of the cool things that he has been talking about. So this has been Pickup Lines presented by Gomez Law Fights. Again, the eclipse happening uh, Saturday morning. For more information, go online to find out what they're doing here at San Antonio College. And until next time, I'm Ernie Zuniga. Have a fantastic week. For now. Bye.